Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, so let's see, looks like uh, we're missing some people here today. So Rachel and Hannah. Uh, Rachel's right here. Oh, there's Rachel. Where Hannah Z is. Hi. Oh, Hannah Z's at volleyball. 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 Yeah, my, my daughter might have me go take her to that game. So I may, may see her. I should take her some calculus to do or something between, between volleyball matches. All right, um, let's see. Uh, Oh, everybody's there in St. John's and Winslow, so we're just missing Hannah Z then today. Okay, so um, all right, so I have a question for you. Uh, before we get started, we, uh, we're going to finish 3.8 today and go on to 3.9. <clears throat> so we're going to, um, I don't know if we'll finish 3.9 today, but we, we will on Monday for sure. And so what I'm looking at is um, uh, two scenarios. And really, it's whatever works better for you guys is fine with me. Okay, so... What, what we need to do is we need to take uh, the chapter three test and then the midterm, okay? And so what I'm wondering is, is would you prefer to take those all in one week or do you wanna take the chapter three test next Wednesday and then the midterm like on uh, like the next week? Would you rather do that or load them all up in one week? Not, Not one week. week. Not one week. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's fair enough. Okay. So um, anyway, so what we'll do is um, so you can sort of pencil in then uh, if we do next week is going to be the um, let's see. So next week, will, next Wednesday will be the 30th. So then our midterm will be like uh, probably like the 5th and 6th of November, something like that. Okay. So just, um, again, because I, I just, you know, as, as soon as we can nail down the dates, then I want to do that. So, uh, so I think that's what we're going to be shooting for. All right. Well, um, so today we want to finish up that last problem on 3.8. And I didn't know if before we dropped off if I'd given you enough to solve it. So did, did anyone by chance happen to finish that problem? I wasn't sure if I would really got through enough of it yet. So anyway. So let's let's pick it up from there and let's see here. Ah, what happened? Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, this was the last practice on 3.8. And uh, so just to go through, it says water is flowing at the rate of 100 cubic meters per minute from a concrete conical reservoir, reservoir vertex down. Okay, so the, the rate that it's flowing out, okay, that's the change in volume. So you would say dV dt is negative 100 cubic meters per minute because it's flowing out. Okay, here we have our cone. 
uh, vertex down. The base radius is 100 and the height is 10. Okay. How fast is the water level falling? So what we're looking for is dH dt when the water is 5 meters deep. Okay. Oh, I remember we were, this actually, this part that we were talking about when we dropped off yesterday, this is actually a, an important idea for these cone type problems. If, if, you know, we have those. What it is, is that, uh, see, if the cone is full, then it's 10 meters deep and the radius is 100 meters. But in any level, wherever you put the water level at, see, it changes the radius and it changes the height. Whatever the height is, it's going to have a different radius of the water, the surface of the water. Okay, But this is the key idea, is in geometry, we use the term similar figures, is that they will be proportional. So whatever this ratio, whatever this ratio is to height to radius, that's always going to be the same, no matter what the water level is, the, the height of the water and the radius of the water to the, to the cone is going to be the same. So here if we say the radius is 10 times whatever the height is. So if the height is 10, radius is 100. So that is going to be the same. So here, if if the radius is, you know, I mean, if the height is 1, then the radius out here would be 10. Okay? So this idea is important. And I'll show you why in just a second. Okay, so now what is the formula for the volume of a cone? Anyone tell me that? Uh, volume is one third pi r squared times height. One third pi r squared times the height. Very good. Okay, so so we need that. Now, but before we jump in and start doing the derivative, what we want to do is use this to substitute in. Okay, because we don't know anything about or we're not even trying to find anything about how this radius is changing, what we want to know is the water level. The D, we want the dH dt. So what we do is we replace R with 10H. And so now if we simplify that, Okay, so now if we simplify that, 10H squared, that's going to give us 100 thirds pi, and then H squared times H is H cubed. So now taking the derivative is going to be much easier, okay? So now I want you to take the derivative of this with respect to time. And actually, see if you can solve for dH dt. So finish out the problem. So take the derivative with respect to t, and then plug in and solve for dH dt.
All right, so Chloe, what's the derivative here? What's dv dt? So I wasn't really sure if you did 100 uh, over 3 times 3 or if you yes. included the pi with that, or uh, do you not well, include the pi? Well, you, the 3 is so, going to cancel with this 3. Oh, okay. So when I did that, I, I got 100 pi h squared. That's good. Okay, 100 pi h squared. So, so far, so good. Times? Then, uh... What, do you replace the, oh, no, no, oh, no. Then, no, 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 then, it, then it's times uh, dh, dt? Yes, yes, that's okay. what I wanted to say. Sorry, I, I forgot. No, you're, you're good. Okay. All right, so Jordan, what do you have uh, for DHDT? Or tell me what, when you get it. I got DHDT is equal to negative 1 divided by 25 pi. Okay, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's the exact answer. Here, let's write that up. So, uh, dh dt, so this uh, simplifies to negative 1 over 25 pi, or that would be, negative 0 0.013, okay? And that's going to be meters per minute, okay? So that's not a huge amount, but we've got a, you know, we've got a huge uh, reservoir here, a huge tank, and it, we're just pumping out water. And so the water level is not going to be changing all that much, okay? So great job, Jordan. Any questions on that? All right, any other questions on 3.8? Okay, so let's go to the last Uh, section here of chapter three. So th 3.9. All right, so this is linearization and differentials. Okay, now this is the section that hopefully before we finish this section, so probably on Monday, I'm gonna show you an example that's gonna make you smarter for the rest of your life, okay? It's gonna add a permanent point of intelligence to you that you get to carry, you'll never lose it, okay? So uh, hopefully that'll happen. So linearization and differentials, all right. Part one, finding a linearization. Sometimes we can approximate complicated functions with simpler ones that give us the accuracy that we want. So why do we why would we do that? Well, because maybe the the calculus or the the physics or whatever that we need, it's much, you know, we can make our lives a lot easier by, by uh, simplifying the function. So this is the idea, okay? Pretend for a minute that you only know how to do calculus 
on lines, okay? Like, let's say you know that the derivative of y equals 2x minus 1, you know the derivative is the slope, and that's 2, all right? But let's say that y equals x squared, that's too complicated, and you don't know how to do calculus on that, okay? So we're just pretending here. So the idea is that this blue curve is really complicated. All right, but we know this one is easy. Well, if we were to, if, if we needed to find, say, the derivative at the point 1, 1, well, if we zoomed in close enough on the calculator, then the line and the curve are indistinguishable. And so for all intents and purposes, that line is the curve, is equal to the curve near that point. Okay, now look how much we had to zoom in though. Okay, so our x goes from 0.997 to 1.003. Okay, and, and so, and same with our y. So, so we had to zoom in quite a bit, but near that point, the line and our really complicated curve, y equals x squared, are for all intents and purposes the same. So then we could say, oh, now the slope, the derivative is 2 at that point, okay? So, again, so when we talk about a linearization, what that means is it's a line that approximates the curve, okay? At that point. But it's only at one point because as you get farther from the point, then the linearization is less accurate. See, right here, the line and the curve are the same, but the farther away that you get, the difference is, uh, in, uh, is expanded. The, the difference uh, is expanded as the, 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 the curves get farther apart. Okay, now, so how does this work? How do we come up with this line? Well, it actually starts with a formula from algebra. You might remember the point-slope formula, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And so if I were to solve this for y, I would add y sub 1 to each side, and I get y equals y sub 1 plus m times x minus x sub 1. That really is what we're going to do, but we actually give it this we sort of label it in terms of calculus, okay? But this that's highlighted is really the point-slope formula solved for y, okay? But this is how we're going to write it down in calculus, and I think this might go in the on the blank. Let me take, take, make sure, okay? Okay, so sometimes we can approximate complicated functions with simpler function, a line. If f is differentiable, oh, maybe, maybe it's on the next slide. Okay, yeah. If f is differentiable at x equals a, then the approximating function is, so instead of, so we, we replace y with L of x for linearization. And then y sub 1, that's the y coordinate. We're going to call it f of a. And then in place of m, we're going to say the derivative at a. And then x minus x sub 1, we're going to just write x minus a. So a is like the x coordinate. And the f of a is the y coordinate. So this highlighted part is what we're going to use. Okay. That's, that's what we call the linearization. Okay. All right. So let me give you an example. So a couple of things that we need. Okay. We, we, I mean, think of the point-slope formula. We need a point and we need a slope or the derivative. Now, sometimes we're given the point. Sometimes we might just be given the x value. 
So if we're just given the x value, you have to plug in to figure out what the y value is. So you've got to get the point if you don't have it. Okay, next to get the slope, we have to take the derivative and plug in. All right, so the derivative, y prime would be, okay, so chain rule time. So 1 half times 1 plus x to 1 lower power. So that's the power rule. And then times 1, okay? So now we simplify that and, uh, well, I guess I just plugged in. So uh, at when x is 0, when we plug in 0 here, we're going to get 1 plus 0, which is 1. 1 to the negative 1 half is 1. And 1 times a half is a half. So the derivative is a half. And so now I plug into the, to the function L of X equals. So it's the Y value, the F of A, plus the derivative at the point, one half times X minus the X value, which is zero. And so then we just clean that up a little bit. And so we get, whoa, we get L of X equals one plus one half X. So that's the answer. Okay, so see if you can do practice one. All right, so Denon, what do you have? All right, let's start with the y value. When x is zero, what's, what's the y value? What's the f of zero? It's one. One. Okay. So you're going to have the point zero one. All right. And uh, what's the derivative? Uh, one over one minus x squared. Okay. So. 
1 over 1 minus x quantity squared. Okay? So, okay? So, what's the derivative at x equals 0? When you plug 0 into that, what do you get? So what's the y prime at zero? One. One. All right. So the y prime of zero is one. And then we have the point uh, uh, 0, 1. Okay. okay, so here's our point. Here's our slope. So then what's the answer? L of x equals what? One plus one times x minus zero. Yep. Okay, and then uh, clean this up a little bit and you get L of x equals one plus x is the answer. Okay. All right, any questions on that? Okay. All right, so it says a linear approximation normally loses accuracy away from the center. Okay, so if you're trying to find the tangent at a point, you can do a linearization. But as you get farther and farther away, you can have a lot of other, I mean, the, that might not even be close to what the derivative is at somewhere else on the curve. So it's just the linearization only works at the point. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, have you do this one. Now this is the same f of x that you had in practice one. So all I'm doing here is changing the x value, okay?
All right, so right when you've got it. Um, L of X equals negative one half plus one fourth X minus three fourths. Okay, so it, um, so you had this right here. So if you have the negative one half and then the minus three fourths, see, I would rather you either left it like this or combine those like terms and get negative five fourths. So either don't distribute, but if you do distribute, then combine those, those fractions. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I forgot to combine those. So. Okay, okay. All right, well, good job. Any, any questions on that? Anybody want me to work through it? We're good. All right. Okay, so uh, linearizations are calculated the same way for trigonometric functions. So whether it's sine or cosine, secant, any of them. It's, it's going to work out the same way. So, but let me go ahead and show you an example before I have you do one. So find the linearization of f of x equals cosine x at x equals pi halves. So first we need the point. So plug in pi halves into the function, and the cosine of pi halves is 0. Okay. So our point is put pi halves comma 0. All right, now that you um, take the derivative. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and then you plug in pi halves, and so the negative sine of pi halves is negative 1. All right, and then you're ready to write down the linearization. The linearization is the y value, 0, plus the derivative at the point, negative 1, times x minus the x value. Then you clean it up a little bit, and you get L of x equals negative x plus pi halves. All right. So go ahead and try practice three, please. So Hannah, I thought you played volleyball too. Thanks. No, I just do basketball. Just basketball? Yeah. And Rachel, did you play last year? No. Nope. No? Nope? Hmm. But you did play basketball too, right? No. Nope. <laughs> That's weird. Why am I associating you with the basketball? You're game? probably thinking of Hannah B, who was in the class last year. Okay. Yeah. Probably. Maybe every hand. Or Timmy. <laughs> Timmy was on the basketball anyway. Never mind. Okay.
All right, so Denon, when you've got it. Pi minus x. Good job. All right. Excellent. Any questions on that? Anybody need me to work through it? Okay. So, so it seems like you guys have a good understanding of this linearization. Okay. So I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, make you smarter right here. Okay. So the first thing is that with linearization, it can be shown that 1 plus x to the k is the linearization for that can be 1 plus k times x. Okay, and but that's only true when x is near zero, but any k. All right. So that linearization is is important. Now, while you're looking at that, I, I'm going to start off telling you a little story. Okay. So when I was just a freshman in college, I was in this. Um, um, I was a physics major at this honors uh, program, and I mean, it, it was pretty exciting because at the university where I was at, they had like a super collider, and you know, if, if you ever saw like uh, Cisco on the flash, that was like me, that was going to be me. Anyway, but as I started studying physics, there were some basic ideas that I didn't understand. And the more I studied, I couldn't get it. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what happened is that, um, that this idea linearization was the key. Let me just kind of jump ahead. Okay, so the, this, the idea of linearization actually was what I didn't understand, okay? Because I would, anyway, uh, so the, this in particular, applying this formula to this, see, if you rewrote this as 1 minus x squared to the negative 1 half, then it, that linearization you could write as 1 plus 1 half to the x squared. Because so here the k is a negative 1 half. And then it's like your x is, you're substituting an x squared. Okay? But, but the idea that this is not equal to this, but we're doing a linearization to this. And I remember studying for hours... And I guess I didn't understand that word linearization. And I didn't understand that it was an approximation. But I would try to show how to figure out how this was equal to this. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? Well, I'll, I'll tell you in just a second. 
in, in a couple minutes anyway. But this linearization idea is, is important. The other thing that we need to know is a little bit of physics. So from physics, um, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Okay, if y'all had a little bit of physics, or maybe that's in like even general science or something, but one half mv squared. Do y'all know what kinetic energy is? What what's kinetic energy? It's the mo energy like in motion that's moving. Right, the energy from, from motion. So if I like throw something at you and it hits you, it, the motion of the object is, is giving the energy, okay? All right, so we have to know, understand that. So it's one half mass times the velocity squared, okay? All right, now, <clears throat> okay, so Isaac Newton, came up with the formula that a lot of you might know, force equals mass times acceleration, okay? But he actually did it in more of a calculus terminology, is that he actually said it's the change with respect to time of mass times velocity. And, and since the mass is constant, then really it's the change in velocity with respect to time. And we know the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. But originally he had, uh, New, Isaac Newton had this idea of it's the change of mass times velocity, which ends up being mass times acceleration. Well, Einstein kind of changed it up a little bit and he says, well, actually, Mass, is, that mass isn't always constant. That as objects get closer to the speed of light, their masses change. Okay, the faster an object goes, its mass changes. And so, so he said that this mass is actually the mass at rest, the initial mass, divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared divided by c squared, where v is an object's velocity and c is the speed of light. Okay? So that's what Einstein came up with. All right? So now, if we take... From our knowledge of limits, okay, this is crazy. Okay, as v approaches c, what would this denominator approach? Zero. Zero. And so you can't have that. And so the idea is, is that remember, if you have a constant over zero, then that limit approaches infinity. And so what happens is that the mass, the, a, a mass gets heavier and heavier the closer that you come to the speed of light, okay? So, so what he did is he said, well, let's, uh, it, we can't really talk about at the speed of light, so let's just talk about as we get close to it, he Instead of using this limit, he used the linearization. Okay? Now, so the linearization, using the approximation 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is 1 plus 1 half x squared, that linearization that we did, that I didn't understand, is that he wrote the formula... 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared as 1 plus 1 half. And so instead of this x squared here, it's v squared over c squared. So v squared over c squared. And for the life of me, I tried and tried and tried to understand that step. And I didn't understand it until 
I think there's a part of my brain that was working on that for like 20 years. And then one day I'm teaching a calculus class, linearization, and I'm like, that's it. That's it. That's the missing piece of the puzzle. This part right here that I struggled with, it's not equal. He used a linearization here. Okay? And so then M is the initial mass over 1 minus V squared C squared. Now, so if I, by using that linearization, then this becomes 1 plus 1 half V squared over C squared. And so now I distribute the M sub 0. M sub 0 times 1 plus M sub 0 times 1 half V squared C squared. All right, so now uh, let's see. We also split V squared over C squared to V squared times 1 over C squared. And then M minus M sub 0. So what, would, what does this mean, M minus M sub 0? What would that even mean? What would that mean? Um, the mass of the speed that it's at minus the initial mass? Yes. So the, the mass that it's at minus its initial, initial mass. So that's the change in mass. So the change in mass is equal to 1 half m sub 0 v squared times 1 over c squared. And so now, to get rid of the c, 1 over c squared in the denominator, we multiply each side by c squared. All right? And now, this 1 half m sub 0 v squared, what, what did we say that is? What, what is this part right here? It's energy. So the entire that's, equation is, is E equals mc squared. Yes, that's it. So that's kinetic energy. So what we end up with is that change in energy, that kinetic energy is the change in mass times the speed of light squared, or as we know it, E equals mc squared. Now, if you, I know you probably didn't understand all of that, but understanding, you understand a lot of it, I'm sure, and you're probably part of the 0.001% of the population that understands the basis of it, the calculus and the physics. And the more you st study that, the more you'll get. Okay? So, that's the theory of relativity, folks. So, you're almost there. You're almost there. So we'll pick it up from there on Monday. You guys have a great weekend. Good luck in all your games. Well, not you, Mogion. But um, the rest of you, good luck. Um, are, are you going to come to our game? I, I might. I've talked to my wife. And I think I'm going to go to the volleyball game today.